Hello class, it's me again. Nice to see you all. It's week five and I'm gonna give here just a very brief um, lecture, video lecture, video talk, video commentary, whatever you wanna call it, on the concept of and the proofs for the existence of God. That is the topic of chapter five. Now I work on religion, philosophy of religion, some theology. So this is territory that's familiar with me that I'm familiar with, excuse me, maybe it is familiar with me as well, I don't know. Um, so I just want to highlight, a f I don't know, the, the main narrative of chapter five. Please do read it. It's longer. You can skim parts of it. But most of the chapter is a kind of critical reconstruction of some of what you might call the classic proofs or arguments for the existence of God. I'll highlight just a couple here. And then the chapter closes with um, what you might call the believer's leap of faith and how that might be one possible ground for believing. Now, I don't think, as a theologian and philosopher of religion, I don't think that any of the proofs uh, for the existence of God are actual proofs. They're not proof in the modern to late modern definition of the term proof. It's not like you can come up with an argument that's ironclad and everybody goes, oh, okay, now I believe in God, great. Before I didn't, but two minutes later, I do now. Um, I think proofs for the existence of God tend to misunderstand, misunderstand what God and who God is, according to many of the world religions, specifically the Abrahamic faiths who see God as a dynamic, mysterious, interpersonal being who cannot be grasped in an idea or argued for or against, but is rather more of an encounter and a way of life and a set of practices installed in communities of worship. And so having an argument doesn't always make sense. For example, I believe in God and I don't really care about arguments. Uh, you couldn't convince me otherwise. Now, I'm not a, I'm not dogmatic about it. I think that the story that my belief in God tells is a powerful story that gives me meaning. It provides me a narrative. It provides me a community of others who can come into solidarity with, uh, with me and my, my beliefs and practices. And I would say primarily my religion, my Christianity, for example, is not a set of propositional beliefs. It's more of a way of life. It's more of a, more of a walk in wisdom, more of a social practice. Um, which is embodied and textured and in collective solidarity with others. So arguments only go so far. Even if I could just imagine you come across an atheist, and many of you probably are in this class, so imagine I come across you and an atheist, or if you're not, you come across an atheist, and imagine you could convince them in 60 seconds with an argument, this is why God exists. And they look at you and they go, wow, that's good. That's logically sound. I have no comeback to that. That's wonderful. I love the logic. And then you ask them, so now do you believe in God? Would you give your faith, give faith into that? Would you profess faith in that God? Would you then begin to practice that religious tradition? They look at you and go, no, I'm okay. I liked the logic, but I'm, you know, I got my own way of life. So arguments don't always persuade in the sense that we think they do, especially when it comes to morality, religion, metaphysics. Um, a couple of the most famous proofs very quickly. Um, one would be causality, the proof of causality that we have a series of causes um, because everything that we experience is an effect of, an, of a cause, excuse me. So there is nothing that happens that was not caused by something that happened just before. Does that make sense? Uh, philosophers and scientists would agree with this. There is a web, or you could actually say chain of causes that just keep going back. So what caused me to talk was vibrations of my, my vocal cords. What caused the vibration of my vocal cords? Some decision in my brain sending signals to my mouth and body to create those, those noises. What created those those thoughts in my mind, I don't know, the way my mind is created. Well, what created my mind? 
I don't know, my parents got together and created me. Well, what got together and created my parents and so on and so forth. You can kind of perform a, a genealogy of causality, so to speak, of any event or object or experience, and it will continually go back ad infinitum. I mean, you could just keep going back. So much so that philosophers would say uh, the world is vulnerable to infinite regress of causality, meaning there is no end of causality. So much so that infinite regress means, well, where the question begins, where did it all begin? Certainly there has to be some cause at the beginning. Otherwise, it's just kind of like the whole causality chain doesn't quite make sense because you might be in the middle of a chain of causalities, but you want to go all the way back to the beginning. Where did it, where did, is there a first cause? And so that's where theology comes in and says, yes, there has to be, in order to stop the infinite regress, there has to be a being that caused it all, but a being who is not subject to causality himself. So that would be what is often called, called the uncaused cause, which is God, which is what Thomas Aquinas would say is what everybody names as God. So that's one argument for the, for the existence of a, something like a creator being so powerful that it doesn't need causality. Causes itself, uh, you could say. That's what Descartes would say. Um, so that's one argument. The, the other famous arguments uh, have to do with design, you know, that we can see by way of analogy that when we design a watch, we just look at it and we can say, this is obviously, there was a watchmaker that made this. You know, it didn't just, didn't spontaneously appear. Um, so many will look at the world by way of analogy and say, this didn't spontaneously appear. We didn't spontaneously appear. Even over millions of years of evolution, we're too complex, which is often called irreducible complexity. We're too complex for that. We cry out for a designer by the way we look, act, function, by the way the world appears, and so, so forth. So that argument usually just says the design of the world and of humans reflects or points to a designer of some kind, which would be proof for something like a creator craftsman, uh, something like a god. Um, so that's one argument. The other is the cosmolog or the ontological argument, which is very, uh, very clever. Um, uh, I kind of like it. I'm not sure what to make of it. That goes back to Anselm. You'll be answering this week's question on it uh, the, for the discussion board. But basically, Anselm says, "Think of a of that which nothing greater can be thought." Okay. Everything you think of it has to be, it transcends every thought. There is something so mysteriously and great and transcendent about God that is, it is that which nothing greater can be thought. And he says, because you can think it, it's a concept in your imagination. But if it were to be truly great and nothing greater can be thought about it, so it can be the greatest of everything, it has to be actually in existence because being in your mind is not good enough. Being in your mind is inferior to being actually in existence. Now, there's a lot of assumptions there. Why is something in space and time better than something that's in your mind? And uh, is there really a difference between something being in your mind and something being really and you know, tangible? Uh, is your mind not tangible? Are thoughts not tangible in some way, embodied? But for Anselm, he's basically saying there's a big difference between something just being in your imagination and then something actually being exterior to your imagination and having its kind of own self-sufficiency as a being at its own, on its own, stands on its own legs, so to speak. Okay, so that's, that's the ontological argument. That's something I want you to wrestle with. It's purely philosophical a thought experiment. It's brilliant. It's fascinating. It's endured for over a thousand years for a reason. Anyway, so those are a few of the arguments that, it, that are run through um, and I hope you enjoy the chapter, and we'll see you next week.